Hi everyone, welcome to season two of Unmasked. Thank you so much for all of your love and support thus far. As I say all the time, it really keeps this project going. Uh, now today, we're gonna to be talking with Karen and we've got a few topics we're gonna to be talking about. We're talking PTSD, anxiety, depression, and of course being admitted to a mental health unit. So what's involved in that process um, and of course, what she learned from going through that as well. So from diagnosis uh, to being admitted and then of course uh, to leaving and just finding a new, better you. Um, now, of course, I gotta say that I'm, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a counselor and I have to remind you, I'm just a human being that just wants to make a positive impact in the mental health community. And by doing so, I wanna get so much awareness out there about something that we forget to think about each and every day. And that is one another. We are all human beings. We all go through highs, we all go through lows, and it's important that we need to be there for one another if one of us is down. And that's exactly why I've created this series, uh, Unmasked, is to show what really goes on in someone's brain each and every day. And a lot of the time, uh, we tend to hide these, these mental traumas that are going on, but I'm, the, the idea of this show is of course to tell you that you don't have to hide it. You, you can come out, you can talk about your experiences and in turn, it's, it's healthier to do so, you know, to talk to someone about these struggles that you are going through. So let's go talk with Karen. My name's Karen, I'm 33 years old. I've experienced anxiety, depression, OCD, and PTSD. Karen, what were the main factors that contributed to your experiences with mental health? Uh, my experiences with mental health have been quite varied. You can track my OCD probably the longest. I had traits of it as a kid. Um, I didn't know it was OCD back then. I just knew that I needed to check things and I didn't feel comfortable unless they were checked. Uh, my anxiety, I was also uh, pretty, pretty nervous as a kid. Um, I would worry about things, I would experience nightmares a lot, uh, but it was just always kind of put down to having a vivid imagination at that point. Uh, and then it wasn't till I was just out of high school that everything kind of escalated for me. Uh, so I was in a big car accident, I had an MVA, where we got uh, T-boned at an intersection. I'd actually like spun the vehicle. And I, at that moment, had actually turned to face the driver and tell them to slow down because I thought they were going to take a bad risk. Uh, and in that moment, they pulled out. And so my head swung through 180 degrees uh, and I tore everything at the back of my neck, down the front and the side. And from that, being 18 and young and naive, I went from the world is my oyster and I can do anything and all of a sudden I was very, very broken. And that kind of infiltrated all of my experiences and it came out most in my uni degree. I lost all my confidence. I struggled to hand in assignments and there was one particular assignment I was working on and all of a sudden it was every ounce of my confidence just vanished and I, I can't do this. And it was just the strangest little trigger. It was a tiny thing, an insignificant moment. But I know that that was the moment that everything finally broke. Uh, and that's when the severe anxiety uh, kicked in and it was a very fast downward spiral from there. Okay, so all these experiences you're saying contributed to the crisis team being called. So at what point did you notice, okay, there's a severe issue going on with yourself, but not only that, when was the point in time where your family realised that, okay, there's, there's something going on with my daughter? Uh, I think my family realised there was something wrong, but at that time, you don't really know, oh, do I give her a hug? Do I take it to the GP? Do I take it to the hospital? What level do I need to go to, to kind of rectify this and make it okay? And so for a while, I think it was give her a hug and tell her it's going to be okay. 
and see what happens. Um, because my anxiety got so severe, I couldn't actually eat anymore. I would just throw up instantly everything that I ate because I was so nervous. Because in that moment, what happens is your stomach is primed for fight or flight. So it shuts down digestion altogether. Uh, so the next step was I was getting taken to the hospital um, because I had exams to sit and uni was my focus. And I still was like, oh, I'm gonna do this. And then the hospital was like, all right, we can fix your, your physical symptoms, but mentally like, oh, you just have to realize there's no danger. You're okay. Um, and it, it wasn't working. I got to the point that I couldn't be in a room alone, not because other people wouldn't allow it. I wasn't comfortable. I would sleep in the floor, on the floor of my parents' bedroom. I would, as soon as I woke up, I would find whoever was awake in the house. I would have my cup of tea and I would just lie on the floor with my tea. And it was at that point my parents realized like we, we need to call the crisis team at this point because we are at the end of our knowledge base. We don't know what to do. Um, and so they were called out. Uh, it was very immediate to them that something had to happen. Uh, and that's when it was the next day I was organized to go into a private health um, facility uh, for mental health and I was in there for about a month so it was it was a pretty big step um, my mom actually found it most difficult uh, the place that I went to was actually an hour away from my home and she cried the entire way home um, because she just dropped her baby there. And they drove the hour every single day just to see me, to be like, it's okay, we still love you, we're still here for you. We just don't know how to help you right now, so you need to be here. And that's, that's something I, I really want to touch on as well is, so being admitted, to hospital or, or noticing that, okay, this might be the best move for me. Um, there's gonna be a lot of people um, out there watching this video that feel like they're right on the edge, but they might be too afraid to take that, yeah. that extra step, extra step, I, sorry. I, I can totally empathize with that. I felt so ashamed, so embarrassed that I broke my own brain. I, that's how I felt, I was like, everyone else is managing and I'm not, and I did something wrong. And I felt so much shame associated with that. And I think that's why it got to the point that it did, because I didn't speak out sooner, because I was ashamed. And if I had, it could have been redirected a lot faster. It may not have got to the point that it did. Uh, I don't recognize myself back then because I hadn't been eating properly in weeks and weeks and weeks. I got down to 35 kilos and I couldn't see it. It wasn't that I wanted to lose weight or I wanted the perfect body. The anxiety had taken hold that strongly, I couldn't see it. Uh, so it was definitely a really hard choice to make. But at the time I got to that point that I realized if I don't do this, I will die. Because at the time, it was that intense all the time. It wasn't as if I could, I had voices going on. It was, if you step out in front of this car, it will end it, it will stop this. And I could hear it and I knew that it's not a good thing to do, but Essentially, that's what my body was like. This is the only coping mechanism you have right now. And so I picked the other one uh, just on the hope that it could help. I can definitely empathize uh, with you on that as well. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people feel like that's the only way out is, is to step out in front of a car and, and commit suicide. But for you to take that extra step and say, okay, no, I, I need help. Um, and then of, of course you're on the road to recovery then, but I really want to talk about the process with the crisis team. So yeah. from the moment, like how were they called? How did the assessment go down? 
And then, um, of course, how was the experience with them and how was the experience in the mental health unit yeah. as well? Um, when the mental health team was called, I don't actually remember a lot of it. I think I've blocked a lot of it out because it's very traumatic for me. I do remember being told the crisis team were on their way because I was on the floor in a mess, sobbing uncontrollably, saying, I can't do it. I can't do this anymore. And it was almost the same as if you've broken a bone and someone's reassuring you the ambulance is coming. That was kind of the process that we went through. And then I, being on the floor, can see these, these people standing up, looking down at you. And it's, it's not a good place to be. It's, it's quite confronting because you know that it has to happen, but it doesn't make it easier for it to happen. Um, I just remember them making a very quick decision. And that hurt <laughs> because I had to face what was going on when they made that really fast, yeah, she has to do this. So they, they made the they assessment, made the they made they the, made the a, final decision. They made yeah. a decision um, that was, this would be in your best interest. This is what we recommend. Uh, this is what happens. And so my parents then got the ball rolling in conjunction with my GP. But at the end of it, when I got to the hospital, I was the one who had to sign the paperwork. I was the one who had to, they didn't put uh, hospital bands on you. They took your photo so that they can identify you all the way through the ward. Um, and it was the most horrible photo I've ever taken in my life because you're at the worst moment of your life. And there's a stupid little bit that I remember and you're like, someone's taking a photo, you should smile. And realize that I couldn't. And I think that's also why I don't have a lot of photos from that time because that photo, it was really hard to get in front of a camera after that because it was like everyone can see every bit of your weakness and all of your flaws right there. And so I shied away from it for many, many years. So what was the experience like being in, the, in a mental health unit? Like, was it, was it comfortable? Was it uh, reassuring? Was it refreshing or was it the complete opposite? Uh, I don't think... <laughs> I don't think it was comforting. It was, I was on this ride and I didn't know what kind of ride I was on. And you're trying to figure out what's happening, what's going on. And at this point they're trialing you on all these different medications and you're experiencing all these different side effects. And so not only are you dealing with what was already going on, you then have to deal with, oh, I feel like I'm rocking within my own head right now. Oh. I'm having all these traumatic experiences because one of the side effects is I'm now getting night terrors and I've broken all my fingernails because I was trying to scratch a wall and I can't get up and walk around too much because I faint. And so it then became, I feel like I've swapped one problem which hasn't actually really gone yet and I've got all these other things. So it was kind of a distraction uh, but not, not much comfort at that point. Um, it was the one thing that I do remember that was comforting in a really strange way was when I was there, a lot of other people that were there were middle-aged and I was 19 at the time. And I had this one little thought of, hey, they got to this point and then they have to try and turn it around if I can turn it around at 19, I've got decades ahead after I've, I've changed this, whereas they're halfway through. Um, so that was kind of the one thing I was like desperately holding on to. In, in that position, in that time right then, would you say that you were better before or during or after uh, being in a mental health unit? After. It was definitely one of those things that I think it was necessary for me to go through that. It wasn't pretty, it wasn't fun, but it was necessary so that when I came out the other side, I had this understanding that it wasn't just me, 
and other people are going through things that might not be the same, but they're going through them nonetheless. And even though it was scary and it was daunting, I learned a lot from it. And even at the end of my stay, they kind of had the next intake of people coming in. So I, you kind of get to see the full circle come round of the people just starting that journey of being watched and monitored 24 seven and doing all these mindfulness exercises that you've never heard of. And some actually work quite well and others, they're just not gonna work for you and you have to figure out what ones work for you. But seeing someone at the beginning of their journey right when I'm at the end was also really interesting because I had people looking at me being, oh, I, she can do it, she can turn it around, maybe I can. So that part of it, I think having this staggered intakes was definitely good because it gave you something to aim for. Yeah, great. And, and just kind of backtracking a little bit, I know you, you mentioned uh, medication and this of course is a very controversial topic um, around the world. I've been on medication myself, uh, antidepressants, anxiety medication and, and sleeping medication as well to alleviate um, that pain and those symptoms. But for you and your experience, taking that route where you were on medication yourself first of all what type of medications were you on but also did you find that it helped you oh that's definitely a really hard one in terms of whether the medication was good or bad because it was such a process to even find anything that worked to start with because they kind of use a pyramid and it's the, we use the one with the least side effects first and see if that works and then we track down that pyramid and it's pretty much on the bottom level. Um, the medication that I ended up on they don't generally use on people uh, anymore because it's so heavy duty um, and I, I'm a pretty small person I was in a very heavy dose of a very heavy duty medication it, it was probably enough to trank a horse um, but it was the only thing that kind of tackled that beast within and so it was kind of we've got to be cruel to be kind at this point um, and it 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 did one thing that I'm thankful for it bought me time it bought me time to figure out how to dig up and get out of that hole I don't think it got me out of that hole on its own but it gave me the breathing room to do it myself yeah great so what things did you find that really helped you though during that time because you said it yourself, the medication bought you time. Yes. And that's really great, that's really important. Uh, it gives you that hope, but also, were there any other activities or kind of um, epiphanies you had while you were in there? They had an art therapy room, and while I was in there, you could access this art therapy room. I'd never heard of art therapy. Uh, the first time I went in, I thought it would be fun to play with pottery, and I made a bowl. I didn't realise at the end I would have to talk about myself through this bowl and how it represented me. Uh, I quite enjoyed making the bowl. I can't necessarily say I enjoyed getting tested on why I made the bowl. Uh, so definitely just having that creative outlet. I don't think that I needed to explain why I was doing things. And for some people it might work, but I just needed to process by myself. And I ended up making lots of little artworks and they all ended up being stuck in my room and they were all on the wall next to the bed um, which was quite symbolic for me because that was the wall that I had scratched with my fingernails and I just kind of covered over that with something that I was proud of. When you came out of that experience how did you feel? They had an outpatient program that I had to go to once a week uh, and possibly one of the hardest things, because it was still an hour away from my house, so my poor parents had to drive all the time. And I remember that my dad turned to me and he said, is this my fault? And I felt horrible because he thought that he could cause that within me. And you can't make someone have mental health. It's just something that happens the same as any other illness or injury just happens. And it's when I realise that I'm not the only one going through this. Everyone in my family is on this ride with me right now. They're just looking at it from a slightly different angle. And it was definitely hard. <laughs> yeah, and there, is, there are so many human beings out there, like you said, that are suffering all different types of 
uh, traumas or disabilities or illnesses. So for you to, to take that step, I really want people that are watching this video to, to be able to realize that, hey, they too can, can take that step as well. So um, that was quite a while ago now. Yeah. I mean, how are you feeling now? You know, what things oh, yeah. did you find that like, works? Take that step. It's, yeah. We live in an age of social media where we're always projecting the perfect version of ourselves, and I think it's harder now than ever. We talk about mental health more, but we project our perfect lives more too. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Um, when I went through all this, we didn't have Facebook. It was okay to be my snivelly self with all my tissues and crying in a ball. I didn't have to worry about taking that perfect photo at least once every couple of days to make sure everyone thought I was okay. Um, and I want people to know that it's okay to be you, whatever level you're at. It, it takes a lot of strength to go through mental health. It doesn't make you look pretty, but it takes a lot of, <laughs> a lot of strength. So in your experience, in your own words, do you think it is possible to rewire the way you're thinking? And of course, I'm talking about neuroplasticity. Oh, totally. Totally, you can rewire your brain. Uh, if I look at how I was then to where I am now, I'm vastly different. If you met me then and met me now, you probably wouldn't recognize me. Uh, neuroplasticity is amazing. It's even, I remember talking to my psychiatrist about it. And he, he said, all your thoughts and all your processes, you actually rewire your brain and your processes. And so even though you've had these traumatic events, you, you're different now, your responses are different now because the pathways are different now. And it gave me a lot of hope, it gave me a lot of comfort to know that it's okay to break something. You can build it and you can build it better. So I like to refer to like, that period of my life as the time when I broke my brain, but I kind of feel like I got to build it better than it ever was. So it was a blessing. It was a horribly like wrapped present, but it was totally a blessing. Yeah. So what advice can you give to someone uh, that might be suffering something similar to what you've been experiencing, but more importantly, mental health as a whole? Because, um, you know, you started off, as you said, um, quite broken yeah. and, and you needed that outlet. So from going through years and years of that process of feeling broken to uh, the crisis team being called to being admitted to hospital to trying all these different medications. Do you feel like all of that was necessary and worked for you? And, and would you suggest that to someone else as well? I would suggest seeking help if someone is struggling with mental health, totally. Um, I would also encourage people to let their guard down, let other people in. For me, that was really hard. I was a very self-sufficient person. I didn't like talking about my feelings, even as a kid. My parents had a lot of trouble drawing information out of me. And if I had been able to talk about my anxiety and things like that, it probably would have lessened the load on me. Uh, it's, it's really hard to say, hey, I, I have these things because you're so worried that everyone's going to turn to you and be like, ooh, I, I, I don't know how to deal with that, step back. Um, but also, from the moment I took ownership of I am not anxiety, I am not OCD, I am not PTSD, I am not depression, but I have those things and that is okay. The moment I owned that, everything got less because I wasn't worried about other people seeing it anymore. Because a lot of times we make it worse by trying to hide it. And in my life, even today, I, I have a very good circle of friends and I can say, hey, I'm having a bad head day. Just heads up, this is where I'm at. And then we're cool and it's fine. And it's so much easier just to be open and honest and let that go. It just makes it easier. The other thing that I would recommend is mental health tends to come in waves, or at least in my life, it comes in waves. I have good times, I have bad times. Generally, the waves don't crash as significantly as they did back then, but they still crash. 
And a lot of times we focus on things only when we need to, when we have to. If I had known back then all the, the self-care things that I do now, it would have made the ride so much easier. If you focus on mental health, not only when you're sick, but when you're well, the gap between those waves gets longer and longer and longer. Uh, I cannot say enough how important that is. Just to treat yourself with love and kindness so that when you are in those dark times, we're talking about neuroplasticity, when you're in those dark times, you're already used to talking to yourself with love and kindness. So you were in, when you're in a dark place, you can still do that and it will help you get out faster. Yeah, that's right. And that's why this our project as a whole is so important because we want to be able to give people the knowledge, the education and the motivation to go out there and just accept and, and say, look, I'm feeling pretty low at the moment. But then completely detaching that stigma and saying, well, look, if you are feeling low, you don't have to hide it because as you said, it's going to make it way, 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 way worse. So if you are feeling low, um, there are those outlets out there. And I, I did want to ask you as well, what is a list of things that you found worked for you, but also a list of things that you can give to other people if they are struggling? Oh, if someone's struggling, there's a, a very vast array of things that you can try. Not all of them will work for you, but personally for me, uh, everything down to tea. I'm, an, I'm a nana, I really like tea. And so one of the exercises I was given in the hospital was about mindfulness. And so it was all about just slow down, be here now, hold that cup. What does the cup feel like? Feel the weight, feel the heat coming from that cup. Taste that tea, don't, it's hot. You can't swig it back. It's a process, you have to slow down. And it's a really good metaphor for being like, hey, just stop and breathe. Uh, meditation's also a really good one, but I totally get that when you start, it's hard. It's really hard. And if you manage to meditate for a whole minute, well done. It's really hard, especially when you're behind the eight ball. You have all these racing thoughts and you can't slow them down. It's okay. It's okay to do 10 seconds. It doesn't matter. The, the fact is that you tried. One of the other things you can tell in my life, if I'm struggling, I take more showers because the shower is warm and it's a sensory experience. I can focus on the sensation of the shower, the soap or conditioner that I'm using or whatever that's going on. And it really brings me back to the present. So there's, there's little things. And then if you've got a little bit more wiggle room in your budget, things like massage and going to a float tank and all of those things that we think are luxuries they're not really we're getting our body functioning in a way that's optimum we're making sure that all our muscles work if you've got a, a sore neck or a sore back or whatever's going on it's really hard to be positive at the same time those things are linked so you have to take care of the vessel that's holding your brain yeah that's right it's all about ground in yourself and and as you said for you the tea tea yeah. works for other people it might be coffee for other people it might be running or going to the it gym could be a cake. it fine. could be a cake <laughs> it could be creativity it could be yeah. filmmaking whatever it could be we all have our own individual things yes. that make us really enjoy our the moment enjoy life and you're exactly right and and too often uh, we travel through life thinking too far ahead so we're yes. thinking about the future which will create anxiety yes. So if you can live in the present, live in the moment, ground yourself, life will be much easier yeah. and simpler. And it can be as simple as that. So um, I think in the, in the description as well, I'm gonna leave a whole lot of uh, list of things, things that you can try that will help you deal with anxiety, that will help you deal with depression in natural ways. Um, and of course, if that doesn't help as well, I'll leave some uh, numbers in the description so you can contact anyone if you are in need of just chatting to someone because there's always a way out there to express how you were feeling. Uh, you were never truly alone. So, um, Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. No That's great.
Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Unmasked. I really appreciate it. And Karen, thank you so much for coming on and talking so openly about your experiences. Uh, and of course, a few of the topics there as well uh, were quite controversial. Uh, we're talking about mental health units, uh, medication as well, which I know a lot of people either just don't think about in general, or a lot of people uh, think those uh, methods are, are wrong. Um, but in actual fact, you know, each and every one needs to be okay with realizing that I might be experiencing some sort of mental trauma right now and I need to take action, whether that be going to see a doctor. Um, and as Karen said as well, um, medication might alleviate the pain and buy you some time in the meantime. Um, so there's all these different things that can really help individuals out there going through mental disabilities or mental illnesses. So I really hope you all kind of gained something from um, this conversation because that's what Unmasked is all about, is getting that information, getting that awareness out there and in turn making the world a better place. Now. If you want to be a part of this series, all you have to do is send me an email at inquiries at posdayeveryday.net. I look at these emails each and every day and I really want to hear your story. It could be absolutely anything, but let me assure you, your story is worth it. We need to get that awareness out there. So don't forget to like, share and subscribe and turn that notification uh, tab on as well on YouTube. That way you can be aware of everything that I'm doing on a weekly basis. So thank you so much for joining us here on Unmasked and I can't wait to see you for another episode soon.